Coffee. Rodrigo, what you got? <laughs> Nothing but coffee. Oh, wow! That's a that's a real artist breakfast. Rodrigo, <laughs> <laughs> what did you have? Uh, the same coffee. Same. Oh man, I had I had cheese on a tortilla that I melted in the in the microwave. I ate a lot of it... cheese last night, so I, I couldn't do cheese again this night this morning. So. <laughs> Well, okay, so uh, we are live, and uh, hi to everybody in, on Facebook and on YouTube. Um, uh, welcome to this uh, conversation. My name is Ellen Lian, and uh, on behalf of the Nickel Independent Film Festival 2020, welcome. And um, yeah, I'm very excited for this, uh, this conversation today. It's uh, um, with uh, Prochwala uh, and uh, Rodrigo. Uh, talking about their film and about generally about documentary making. And uh, if anybody has any questions, I will be the, the point man for that. I'll be uh, uh, looking on Facebook Live and on uh, YouTube comments as we go. And uh, so, yeah, um, without uh, further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce Sandy May, who will uh, uh, be leading the conversation. Sandy. Hi, welcome everyone. Thank you to Pajwal and Rodrigo and any filmmakers watching, particularly people who were uh, signed up for the doc challenge. Hopefully there's some good info in here for you. Um, I wanted to, I guess, first to say that I really um, enjoyed the film, The um, Quantum King of Newfoundland, it's a CBC short doc. And um, I guess, yeah, I just want to start by asking why you decided to make a documentary about uh, Madhu Parap. Um, can I go, Rodrigo? Sorry? Do you want to go? Uh, sure. Well, how I found out about it was through Prajwala. Uh, and then when she first told me the story, I was a bit uh, skeptical as to whether there was an actual story here or not. But then she talked me into meeting the family uh, and I was like, oh, wow, okay. They started telling us these ridiculous stories when we were at their, in their kitchen table for like two hours probably. And stories kept coming. <laughs> so I was like, okay, well, we have to do this now. But Prajola can speak more to how she found out about it originally. Um, he is right. I had to talk him into it. Um, there, there was lots of effort there. Uh, but well, well deserved effort, let me put it that way. Um, the story came about uh, at Breakwater Books' office. Um, and I was there speaking to their editor, James Langer. And we were talking about immigrant stories uh, from, from the years gone by. Um, there's a lot of information and stats about why people leave. But my interest was, why did that generation stay? Was it just jobs? What kept them here? And why haven't those stories been told enough? Um, so that's where that started, that conversation. And he was like, oh, you won't believe this story. You know, my friend's father, uh, he opened a condom. He's from India. And he opened a condom factory in the ghouls. I was like, what? And then <laughs> packaging was called Raja, which means king, and Rani, which means queen. And he tagged it, would you like to, wouldn't you like to be the king of the night? And as soon as I heard that, I mean, um, I think I, I go a lot on instinct uh, on how it sort of makes me feel from inside. So that's all I, and I was like, I have to meet these people. There is definitely some sort of story there. Um, so I met with the brothers, Milan and Manik, uh, on a very different uh, summer afternoon, uh, almost actually quite yeah, a year ago. Um, and uh, it was jumping bean when we could all sit across each other and share coffee. And uh, um, I was punctually 10 minutes late. Uh, and uh, they instantly made fun of my Indianness because Indians are known to be late. Um, <laughs> that's how the ice broke. And then I asked them about the condom business and they told me that. And then they were also like, by the way, he was also an artist. I was like, artist? What, what kind of art? Um, paintings. And they showed me his pictures, the pictures of the paintings that he'd made. And uh, that's when I realized this is an onion. There's layers and layers and layers 
um, that needed to be told. Um, and I also realized that I wanted this to be a visual story because I, I have never dabbled in the visual medium. I've usually written uh, more, more so uh, in the verbal medium. Um, mm -hmm. So for me, um, the, the sounding board was Rodrigo to see if this would translate into visual medium because he is brilliant. Um, and uh, he hates he hates being complimented. So I'm going to compliment the SHIT out of out, out of him today. Embarrass him. Um, payback. <laughs> um, in any case, uh, uh, in any case, point being that um, once he heard the story, it um, it kind of made sense that there was there's it's there's strong visuals um, and uh, there's a strong story that needs to be told that has been, hasn't been discovered for a long time, um, has been unheard, unseen, untold. So that's what drew us, I guess, to the story. Mm -hmm. um, so you like, you know, really went on instinct in terms of deciding, you know, whether something was a, a really compelling story, Rodrigo, do you have a different approach to, to kind of knowing whether or not something should, should go into a film or into a script? Uh, yeah, I, te I tend to be a bit more skeptic and pessimistic about, about uh, approaching projects just because whether it translates to a visual project or not, you know, stories can right. be incredible. Not every story has to have images with it. Uh, and to right. this particular example, when Prajwala, you know, mentioned that she discovered that someone opened a condom factory in the ghouls, I was like, okay. And then she was like, but it's already shut down. And that's where the skepticism kicked in. And it was immediately where like, what, what could we even film about it if it's already shut down, if there's nothing to be seen? Uh, and that's when she starts telling me more things. Oh, the guy was from India. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, he came here in the 60s or 70s. Well, that's even more interesting, you know. And then meeting with the guys, uh, getting to see their personalities and how they tell the stories and how they talk about you know, we were talking about racism, about uh, poverty, about, you know, so many things, about interracial marriage that their parents had. And they were doing so in such a charming and natural way that wouldn't mm -hmm. translate necessarily well in just written form. Uh, and then on top of the fact that they pulled out boxes and boxes of archival material and family photos and condom boxes and, you know, all that stuff. And that's where I go like, okay, well, there's something here to be done for sure. Um. So like there's lots of information there and it's like he's an extremely compelling like you know person um but like how did you did you have an idea of what you wanted to kind of tell about him you know like it's this idea that docs are kind of subjective but i i are sorry objective but like there's a story in there that you that you kind of, did you know what story you wanted to tell about him when you started and how did that, how did that evolve throughout the making of the film? Uh, well, I, yeah, what drew me to it uh, was that it was uh, um, an unromantic uh, story of the immigration struggle. You know, mm -hmm. the fact that his sons, the men in the documentary were willing to discuss their father's flaws uh, and that he wasn't perfect, but nonetheless loved by everyone uh, mm -hmm. and a successful man in his life. Uh, and yeah, and, and then the fact that it's, uh, you know, it paints immigration and racism in a much more relatable way. And the fact that, you know, this is just a man who happened to be Indian who wants to do right by his family, right? So it's something that not just people of color can empathize with. It's, um, it's a struggle that a lot of people can relate to. Uh, mm -hmm. So I thought it was a very important story to tell there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think so. Um, so, okay, yeah, I guess the, the idea that he like was really well loved by his family, and, but that he was like, he was kind of, he, he's like everyone, uh, like a complex of contradictions. And um, I guess like, how did you, like, how did you approach that? How did that it, like it sounds like that informed this the the movie a lot sorry the doc a lot like just that that he was so um 
like said he wanted to paint Princess Diana and her <laughs> baby. I was like, just so generous, like, you know, of his heart. And then, and then even, and his, even his like mantra for the condom factory was like, just very, you know, it's like, it was very generous of his heart as well. And I guess, um, but he's like really bristly at the same time, you know, and it seems like he, he, he just was kind of had a lot of contradictions about him. So I guess I'm, I'm kind of curious, like when you make a doc, like how you, how you treat those contradictions, like how you want to show them if, if there's any advice for how to, how to do that. Does that, does so that contradictions as in? Yeah. Like, like he would have been like, you could have shown one side of him, you know, more easily than another, right. you know? So how, right. how do you do, do honor to both of those? But as Rodrigo said, I, I think the universality of this, this uh, story is that it's, it's very human. And if you're looking at a human being, we are flawed. Um, there, it'd be a very boring story, personally, I feel, to tell mm -hmm. that we're either too good or too bad. Uh, the grace is what interested both of us. Um, and the fact that um, it was being told with humor um, and honesty, um, mm -hmm. that's, that's what made it compelling. Um, there was a gregariousness to, to the personalities, to the brothers that uh, shows on screen as well. Um, and uh, the, the contradiction is what makes the story compelling. Um, yes, there was racism, classism, um, many other isms, poverty, um, and they faced a lot, uh, but that he was also human. Um, and, and that's what makes, uh, makes the story very relatable. Um, and it is what we've, at least I've received as feedback is that I connect to it and doesn't matter color, gender, race, um, people connect to that human story of, of struggle. Um, mm -hmm and uh, of bonding, of family, of leaving a legacy behind, um, the question of what is success, uh, what success really is. Um, all those things um, come out through the contradictions and the flaws. Um, and that's why we chose that path. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, so, it sounds like um, when you guys showed up and the brothers you were at their house, and they were bringing out all kinds of boxes and and um, like how do you um, like how did you research the the film? Like there's it sounds like there was a lot there. How do you how do you go through all of that? Like as a as a in particular to this genre, you know, like that you would you would have to sift through lots of stuff, lots of research to piece things together in a Coherently. <laughs> there was um, there was tons of archival material that the brothers had, which made it, um, as Rodrigo said, visually uh, easier to translate. Um, we did not want a land and sea sort of feel. Uh, we did not want something that had been done um, in terms of archiving the in terms of capturing the archives. Uh, what we had also decided on is that uh, there needed to be a larger than life and epicness uh, to, to his visual um, paintings, to his, to his paintings essentially, and, and, and the archives as well. Um, and uh, the way we went about creating it um, happened very organically. Um, it wasn't sort of, it was thought out, I won't say thought out, but uh, it, it sort of just translated one thing after another led to how it was captured. Um, in terms of research, uh, the only piece of um, news that I could find um, was um, through the um, Memorial University's Center for Newfoundland Studies. Uh, mm -hmm. It had one file, one massive file on the ghouls it was this just thin strip of paper that say that uh, was titled "Residence Time Not to Condom Plan," because um, I had to find something to connect uh, what they were saying to something tangible, showing that it had really happened. Um, 
and it, it it goes back to saying how important uh, words are and how important uh, archiving those kinds of stories uh, are because if that weren't there, that little strip, um, there wouldn't be tangible proof from another source uh, indicating that this had happened in Newfoundland and Labrador's history. Um, so the research was, was more um, primary in the sense that it came from the sources themselves. The secondary research um, happened more so through the archives, if you may. And I must add, we had uh, Connor McCann help us with research on certain um, archival footage and videos. So uh, his, his eyes and his brains uh, definitely helped this project. So um, yeah, anything else I've missed, Rodrigo? You wanna add anything? Uh, yeah, well, just in terms of how we handle the archives, <laughs> we had to bring them into my living room. <laughs> My living room has headquarters for like a couple of months and it was just boxes and boxes of things. And Pranjal, Pranjal and I just sat down going through them and see what we had and what we could use and which sort of, which photos or documents connected to what the, our subjects were saying, you know, and which, which stories that they have told us we could also visualize in through photos or texts or objects even. Um, and that's, yeah, how we went about it. Mm -hmm. Did you have any, like any sort of script that you wrote beforehand to kind of base it on or? or? Um, yes, uh, there was a skeleton, uh, if you may, uh, of a vision that we had. Um, mm -hmm. And um, it was split into three acts um, and each act had separate scenes um, and that sort of, and we, we discussed it verbally and then we sort of, um, Locked it on paper, if you may. Uh, for this particular project, our funders, uh, CBC uh, Docs, as well as um, NLFBC, they jointly funded this project, but CBC asks for these things as part of their requirements. Um, mm -hmm. So as part of a deliverable, uh, we did give them um, an outline vision. Um, and, um, you know, we tried to stick to it as much as possible. Uh, and uh, I must um, throw uh, the credit to Rodrigo there because uh, he's, he's really great at uh, zoning in and, um, and keeping us um, focused on, on, the, on the prize, if you may. So mm -hmm. uh, yes, there was a script at the start. There was um, one at the end too, um, but every process is different. Uh, how he and I work is not how I would work with someone else because uh, as, as you move teams, you move processes. Um, mm -hmm. Certain things that are uh, fundamental, I guess, uh, but, but uh, in my collaborations with other creatives, uh, I found that uh, the process changes and your biggest advantage is to understand that the process is changing and adapt, adapt to it. Um, right. So our process would be very different from how each of us work with other individuals or mm -hmm. So um, what worked for us is, is having a skeleton and then uh, doing the interviews, um, gathering the required B-roll, and then trying to write a script after that, um, and, uh, and then honing in into your first rough cut. So that's how that went. Is it, would a fundamental be, like for, for documentary filmmaking, like a script would be, would be, kind of a fundamental would you say or I mean I haven't I haven't dabbled in I'm not a filmmaker so documentaries seem again like they just the the I think when they're good you you don't notice that that handprint you know when they're when they're done really well but you um but yeah I guess I'm wondering like that is that something that you would you would say to other people starting out making docs that they that they need to get a script with kind of a beginning and a middle and an end or? Um, I think it depends a lot on the story. This particular one, this particular doc was very uh, storytelling driven. It was nothing but sort of the boys telling us, you know, recalling what had happened and telling us about their father's life. But then I worked in other things and with Prajalas where we did a, a, a Ramadan video series for CBC here. And that's a lot more, you know, we went into families' houses and we had to just film them uh, through the Ramadan traditions and things. 
and you can do very little scripting in that approach because you're there to observe. Uh, but I guess probably a more more fundamental thing to as uh, that uh, an advice that I would give is just to do base research on what the possibilities of how to tell that story are. Uh, so you know when we approach a more so a fly on the wall project, you you know you ask your subjects you know what they'll be doing in the next week that you'll be shooting and uh, what things you can be invited to so that you can film that as well. And when they have a chance to be interviewed. Uh, so yeah, just uh, gather all the possibilities and then start from what's possible, try to honing into what the best possibility is for telling that story properly, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like in this particular case, as much as we spent probably a total of six hours talking with uh, our subjects before the interviews, before even pitching, I think we had a bunch of meetings of hours and hours long just recording our conversation. Uh, and then from there, you know, you start choosing which stories paint the best picture kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I, I think what it boils down to is, is your story and your vision, that that be the base fundamental. Um, for any any project, but how the process of bringing alive that story and keeping your vision intact that changes according to the teams you work with. Um, yeah. yeah, that's how I would put it. Yeah, and even speaking of the possibilities of this particular doc, uh, because of time restraints and we just yeah. had the worst luck ever because we had to film throughout Snowmageddon. Uh, you know, so it, the entire city was shut down and we had to deliver anyway. You know. Uh, so time started to become real tight. Uh, so we had to shoot all of those overhead flat lay shots of the archival things. We had to shoot without really knowing what the interviews were gonna be. Uh, so a lot of the shots could be a bit more specific into the boys are talking about uh, the condom designs, but we couldn't focus too much on the condom design uh, draft because we didn't know how much of a part of the conversation it was going to be. So our shots had to be quite generic, you know, and that's just part of the possibilities that you need to, you know, take and accept <laughs> whether you like them or not. The fact that our archival shots had to be, you know, as, as general as possible and not as specific as we would have liked, but it was just the possibility of this particular project. Mm -hmm. um, so even with something like snow again or just all all around 2020 um like just all of the different kinds of stories that you know that you can tell i guess like fundamentally what makes a good documentary like are there some things that people have to do or some things that people consistently do that make them not so great that they you know like what are, what are those like what are those things <laughs> for, for me um it boils down to the story the story has to be compelling the story has to um uh, do something to me uh, evoke some sort of emotion um and with this it was a mixture of pathos and humor um, and, and the human struggle. So for me, it boils down to the story you're telling. Um, and uh, and it, I go by a lot by instinct, um, but I also have a very, um, I don't know if, to, if I should say a spiritual take on this, I don't know, but I truly feel that the story chooses you as opposed to you choosing the story. Um, there are so many people trying to make so many different things. There are so many stories that have been told, so many that haven't, um, that I, I sincerely believe that it chooses you and, um, and you are simply a medium through which that story speaks. Um, and uh, and that, that's how I like to look at it. Um, but for me, um, what makes a good documentary is a compelling story. Uh, compelling subject um, and of course the technicalities and um, and how it's shot and how creatively you bring elements together definitely play a role I don't deny that but for me it boils down to what the story is what are you trying to say and why mm -hmm. yeah I think yeah see I have a similar take I think 
uh, when you're watching a documentary, it's uh, it's very easy to tell when the people that created it uh, created a, a product or a, 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 a thing that sort of extends the truth of the story as opposed to sort of projecting your own ideology too hard, you know, and of course you mentioned objectivity and subjectivity earlier and objectivity is definitely overrated in, in, <laughs> in documentary filmmaking. It's not a real thing, you know, you choose where the camera is pointing. Uh, but there is definitely, you know, finding, you can tell whether the documentary found the balance between the people truly caring about the story and identifying themselves within it but then also, you know, just extending, letting the story be told as opposed to forcing it through your own ideals, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. <laughs> it does. Like, do you think kind of with that in mind, like, do you think it's um, important or relevant even like to, to kind of have a personal connection or to kind of mine your own experiences or your own kind of knowledge in how it relates? Like you're probably just talking about like something kind of choosing you, like that's, that, that made me wonder about that, you know, where, where you um, sit. I think my take on doc filmmaking, and I was talking to someone about this very recently, and she told me that, because um, with, with journalism, um, okay, I'm, I'm gonna redo my answer in my head now. Um, with doc filmmaking, you're expected to have a point of view. Um, is what we were discussing. Whereas in journalism, it's supposed to be more uh, unbiased um, and um, you're, you're almost not allowed to have a point of view um, in, in journalism with a capital J. Um, whereas doc filmmaking, uh, you're given, not, not just given, you're expected to have, have uh, your, your take on that subject um, put out there. And that's why you have the same topic explored by different filmmakers and you see different sides of the truth because there's different sides to, to any truth. Um, and yes, I gravitate towards nat stories naturally that, that, like I said, that instinctually um, evoke an emotion in me, whether it's sadness, anger, happiness, they have to tingle me from the inside, if you may. And I'm, I'm vested in it um, and I give it my all. That's how I've always approached it. Um, and how I like to see it is that for that to happen, the story chooses you. Um, I don't know if I made sense at all or I just sound um, completely uh, hogwashed. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is that you, you have, I think personally with doc filmmaking, a point of view is, is almost necessary. And like he said, you're choosing where to put the camera. So by default, you have you have a point of view. Um, did you set out like stylistically with 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 um, you know something in mind for for how you wanted it to look, and then did that did that change throughout the throughout the course of of filmmaking? Um, I'll go first and then you have a lot more to add to that. Um, I remember uh, showing Rodrigo a couple clips of the kind of look and feel I was going for. We watched stuff together too uh, of what, how we wanted the subjects to look, uh, how we wanted the archives to look. Um, I remember sending him an NFB documentary where uh, a subject was placing on a table, it was a top view shot uh, on the table, old letters. Um, and then that sort of snowballed into flat lays and, um, and uh, um, all of those were, were sort of jointly decided. And in this process, I was, I must admit that I am um, a first time filmmaker that you're talking to, so, but he uh, has more experience. So, uh, I did turn to him more for the creative uh, input and aspects, um, but all the decisions were made together, uh, if you may. So one thing organically led to another. Um, there were a few things that we shot uh, and then realized in post that because of the movement, it wouldn't fit um, accurately. So we had to, um, you know, 
what, what's the word you use? MacGyver. Uh, MacGyver. <laughs> uh, I don't know if people will get it. Uh, we had to just rejig uh, in that moment. Um, and, um, and we went about it in, I felt, in a very natural and organic fashion. Um, yeah. And, and for me, as a first time filmmaker, it was, um, I, um, I surrendered, I tried to surrender to the process. Let's put it that way, tried. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, that's how that went about, if you may, from my perspective. And you talking about it. Yeah. Well, yeah, MacGyver is one of my favorite words. It's half the job you have to MacGyver things. Uh, yeah, in terms of coming down to a visual, Prajol and I spent a fair amount of time just in doing pre-production things and just chatting. We would get together for drinks or coffee just to talk about, you know, I mentioned possibilities earlier, uh, but even before you consider possibilities, I think starting with what you would like it to be, it's a fair point, and then you see what the possibilities in achieving that are, and if, if it's even possible. Uh, and so, in terms of changing the vision, it didn't change much. I don't think. I think we stayed pretty true to the original uh, uh, vision of it, um, because you know it worked out. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like in terms of um, the like for possibilities. Um, like you mentioned snowmageddon um like what what other like maybe less dramatic challenges like did you did you guys come up against um well even just <laughs> the, the, the within progella mentioned that we were uh looking at it and trying to make it look larger than life just to trying to uh, you know extend into the documentary the amount of archival material that we had um, and that's when we came up with the idea of the flat list because it's, you know, you can see, you can see it all as opposed to each one individually or bundled together. You see just the massiveness and extent of it. Um, oh. and we'll just finding a location that allows for that to occur properly. You know, you need a high ceiling. We had to rig up an overhead thing to put the camera on. Uh, and yeah, just finding a location that is cost effective, um, accessible with a degree of flexibility because Prajal and I, as she just said, as much as I have dabbled in video work a little more than she has, I'm also still just fucking learning. Can I swear? Oops. Oh, you uh, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so yeah, uh, we wanted to a place that allows us, gives us that room to play with that. But at the same time, you know, be forgiving in the fact that, oh, we might have to use you for more than expected or, you know, a, a little longer mm -hmm. today. Uh, and in the middle of one of the biggest snowstorms in the province. Uh, so yeah, just finding the, the right location that allows for our vision was a big challenge. And the, and the right location was Eastern Edge. Uh, kudos to them. They were really, really uh, supportive of us filming in there. And um, yeah, we couldn't have done it without their support. Um, so we're very grateful to Eastern Edge for uh, providing such a beautiful space to film in. Um, and what we did with his paintings is, yes, we did shoot it within the gallery, but we also, like I keep saying, uh, that we spoke about the epicness and the larger than life feel. Uh, and that comes through the music as well as the, the pan shots um, um, that uh, Rodrigo shot really beautifully. Um, we to 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 achieve all of that, we sort of shot the the paintings outside, uh, outdoors in in landscape spaces. Um, put his his easel, um, his easel easel right. The other one's a palette. Okay, never mind. I keep getting confused always. Um, uh, uh, the easel with with all his paintings outdoors um, and. Mm -hmm of the locations where he's painted things to like Kitty Vitty is we, we shot his, um, what's known as his masterpiece, uh, the ballerina there. So um, yeah, it took a little bit of rejigging the plan constantly because of the snowstorms, of the pandemic, um, but um, we're grateful that the funders were um, patient with us too um, and, uh, and uh, appreciated the challenges that we were up against. For our, my first film. <laughs> so, like, 
flexibility would definitely be something you would recommend. Adaptability. Adaptability. Yes. Yeah. My God. <laughs> I'm go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is a so, that is a fundamental to the story and the vision, MacGyver. That's your third element. <laughs> So for any doc filmmakers watching who are in the challenge, you got that adaptability, that MacGyver ability. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so like those are like not to dwell on negative, but like if you know you have some is there solid ideas of what you need to make something work, like where can people go wrong when they when they make docs? Do you have any thoughts on what what falls astray there for for folks? I I'd say um, be, even with this story because um, the interviews were long and very verbose. There was a lot said. We could have chosen a million different paths to go to even after we had uh, drawn our skeleton structure, if you may. But I think uh, sticking to the, to the vision as much as possible um, is, is what I would say um, is a challenge. Um, and that's maybe where, where things can go awry. Um, yeah, if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're sort of, because there's so many million plus, with, with this example, for instance, there was this whole aspect of classism that the family faced um, through uh, the Indian community here, which we couldn't tap into because of time constraints. But that was part of our orig original vision. Having said that, that in itself could be a story to tell. And if you're not true to what you have set at the start and lose your blinders, you could go meander in many different directions. And what finally comes across, I think, because I'm still very new and learning, I, have, I do not have the answers. I, I even question why I'm here, to be honest. Um, but <laughs> here I am. Uh, but uh, I think what happens is that um, you can go anywhere with, with the story. And if you do, um, and, and try to piece it into what you're trying to tell, it might not come across the right way. Um, that's somewhere you could go wrong. Um, technically, you could go completely wrong and, and <laughs> make a lot of mistakes. Um, funding, funding, if you could have the best story in the world, but if you do not have the resources to tell it, um, that, that is definitely uh, an impediment. Um, and access to, to pitching uh, those stories and those producers, I'd say is, um, is a major impediment as well. So um, what could go wrong is right from the start till the end, you know? So, um, and if you had a, if you didn't record your sound properly, if your lights aren't set up properly, everything, like anything and everything could go wrong. But for right. me, this, what it boils down to is sticking true to the vision and the story. Um, and uh, when you don't do that, then it could go into pieces. Right. Yeah, I think personally, uh, I think, and my personal sort of journey in my career, I've sort of learned to be less afraid of intruding uh, into, you know, with your subjects. I think thinking about mm -hmm. it in the way that you're trying to help them tell this their story in the best way possible. So, you know, don't be afraid of being like asking if we can talk about this or can, can you do this for me again and you film it or, you know, uh, at the end of the day, you're trying to get their story across in the best way possible. They not do a disservice to what they're sharing with you and the rest of the world. Um, so yeah, being just, I think people, can, that's a very intimidating thing, you know, especially depending on the sense, the sensibilities of the themes you're exploring, you know, whether they're more serious and, and harsh. Uh, it can be a little scary to be like, oh, can we talk about, you know, uh, racism or your personal experience or, you know, sexual assault or whatever the, the story may be. Uh, 
that you know no they already agree to work with you and let you tell their story now you don't just try to tell it in the best way possible involving them in the process a little more you know there's different approaches to documentary filmmaking this is just my personal experience you know you can also just go for fly on the wall and never talk to anyone which is also completely fair but i think a more fair place to start is to you know get more involved with the people you're working with yeah I, I must also add that because I hadn't interviewed for a visual medium and my interviews usually dealt with the audio, audio medium or verbal written, written way. Um, what I learned on this process is it's different because you, um, you have to give them visual cues um, as to uh, Yes, it's working as opposed to saying, yeah, yeah, because your voice cannot be recorded there. I, uh, I learned uh, the importance of um, not speaking. Um, and in the moment, uh, <laughs> Manik says, patience with your subjects is a major trait. Yes, yes, it is, Manik. Thanks for tuning in. Um, <laughs> and uh, what I was going to say is that um, he threw me off track. There's a very important point, Manik. Um, thanks for throwing me off track completely. Oh, uh, the, there's a moment in the doc where, um, I, where I've asked the question, uh, was his life a success or a failure? And then there is a pause and um, Milan takes in a deep breath and um, then after a minute uh, answers, and that's what I mean, uh, I have learned is, is to allow them to emote and give them that space uh, because the camera literally captures everything. Um, and it's those minute details that enrich the story. Um, in the past, I have made mistakes and I know once when a sub on Ramadan on the rock, uh, once when a subject, um, subject individual uh, began to emote and cry, I instantly went and hugged her, which I should not have done because, you know, I, as the interviewer, uh, sh should not have that. There should be a, a, a little bit of a divide is how I'd see it. Um, yeah, that's what I learned through this, that, that sort of minute details, they enrich the story. Yeah, and in terms of tech, I mean, just mess around with whatever gear you have doesn't matter how well you know it doesn't have to be the most expensive thing but just even when i first got my first camera ever it was like the cheapest canon camera you can buy uh and what i did was just i put i set my roommates as subjects and i just filmed them testing my camera to failure you know i would change the lights make it as dark as possible see how high i could bring my eyes or my exposure and things before it gets too noisy or too funky uh so yeah just use your friends to test whatever you have and then once you actually go into filming you know where your gear might not be able to help you as much as it would otherwise yeah and youtube is a great resource for learning things <laughs> yeah google googling things is half the job really yeah yeah um ellen did you ask a question did I see something come up there? I, what are some films? Oh, go for it. I accidentally uh, popped in earlier just because I there was I did there was a key command on Zoom that I didn't realize. <laughs> so I was, I accidentally, accidentally was like, oh, I just saw my fa face. <laughs> I, I've been really, uh, uh, really interested to hear all uh, uh, you guys talk about this. This is uh, this has been really enjoyable. Uh, I ha I've been burning with questions back here, but. Uh, um, uh, one of the one of the you know big ones is like what what are some movies that really inspire you or particularly for this movie what what movies inspired you for this particular particular project? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what did you copy? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> we were inspired. We've not. Uh, yes. There's a difference. No piracy. <laughs> uh, I think in terms of, his, I think Prajwala can speak more so to the documentaries that we grabbed examples from, because I don't remember the names, because you were the one to send them to me. 
-hmm. but we always joked around with the fact that Madhus liked the the, the mm -hmm. main person in the condom king, the condom king. Uh, uh, he always resembled a Wes yes, Anderson yes, character yes. in his in the absurdity of his life and how ridiculous the stories are. <laughs> uh, yeah. it could be, it could be, yes, yeah. I mean, yeah. Now that now that you mentioned it, that your film does have that kind of those those moments of stillness, the placement of the the objects, that kind of is a Wes Anderson ish. <laughs> thing I've, I've really loved the the uh the top down shots with the with all the little uh, memorabilia and uh, just little artifacts that kind of tell his story in in a very quick way but probably took forever to set up <laughs> each of those flat lays was just the two of us occasionally vida vida did the stills on this project and she's mm -hmm. amazing too um she was there to help us on a couple of days but usually it was just the two of us uh, literally on the floor trying to uh, make sure it looks symmetrical um, as much as possible. Um, some of the movies, uh, one of them is actually by a colleague. Her name is Jamie Miller. She made Mervais. Um, and um, and uh, she had previously shot A, a Princess Tale. Um, and I was inspired by the epicness from that, um, from that movie. Um, that was definitely a point of reference for me. Um, we uh, took the, uh, we used a, what's it called? A periscope teleprompter inspired by Errol Morris's style of filming where we wanted the individuals to look straight into your eyes. Um, and uh, it cast my face as, uh, as an image, uh, as the interviewer. Um, and the camera was placed right behind that image, if you may. Um, and, um, and that gave up that, that gave you that feeling that they were looking right into you, telling you the story, because I wanted that intimacy, um, created, uh, through the visuals. Um, so a, a lot of Edel Morris, a lot of, um, a lot of short docs, quirky short docs. Some of them, I can't even remember the names, but, um, but yeah. Uh, a Princess Tale is not a quirky short, short doc, but for me, the epicness and the reveal of the art, um, I wanted that from, and that was inspired from A Princess Tale. Um, yeah, so um, in, in general movies, I'm sure his taste and mine are very different. Um, I do like my Indian movies and my Hindu okay. movies. Um, but, uh, you know, I think what, uh, what I gravitate towards in, in any movie, um, is escapism for me. I want to forget my world and enter that world and it should capture me. Um, oh. it evokes something in me. So any story, whether it's the book, film, um, audio, any medium, uh, for me, uh, if, if it is strong, it will, um, it will silence the noise. Um, and allow me to escape into that world for mm -hmm. a little bit. So mm -hmm. I gravitate towards my movies. Yeah, it's it's interesting because each moment, like the you know, uh, some documentaries have a lot of like uh, a lot of like. Uh, or if they don't seem to have as many like moments of uh, real. Uh, 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 I, what, what am I trying to say? I don't even know. <laughs> just like uh, every moment was uh, was uh, loaded was well, like felt like you were enveloped like the the the, the with the com combination of the music and the 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 lighting the um oh yeah i know i remember what i was going to say about the um uh the thing about eye contact uh, or, or like these days with uh, with zoom calls because the the camera placement is always slightly different than than where you are uh then it um uh reduces you know your ability to trust the individual or something you know like or build a bond between them because uh that i've just read some stories about that and uh it's interesting how uh errol morris like identified this problem before with documentary filmmaking and um and I, yeah i did actually notice that i was gonna i was gonna ask you guys so guys if you were inspired by errol morris for that because that yes. that's his thing. <laughs> yes is one word <laughs> answer um and, yes and so, so the, technically, how did you do that? You, like, so your face was transmitted on some screen there's, or something? There's a device that we ordered. Uh, it's called a telescope. Um, no, 
teleprompter periscope. I mixed the two words. No, right. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. You mentioned that. Yeah. A teleprompter periscope. So it mm -hmm. has a two meter system, right, Rodrigo? And mm -hmm. uh, it costs, you sit this side and it costs mm -hmm. your image onto the other side behind mm -hmm. the camera is placed and mm -hmm. the other camera set uh, right next to it. So it was capturing, um, it was a two camera setup, one capturing an angled shot and one capturing straight down. Um, mm -hmm. case this got completely fucked up. So, um, which it didn't. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, that's how that happened. And it, I really feel it creates an intimacy with the, as an interviewer, uh, with your interviewee, um, cause I can see them and they mm -hmm. can see me, um, but we're still, there's no camera, right? So mm -hmm. those sort of, um, gives you that, that connectedness, uh, which answers kind of one of your questions, what's your advice for helping subjects open up to you? Um, I, everyone's approach is different. Um, I think um, depends on the interview too. With, with doc filmmaking, it's much more different than with journalism where you have a finite time to get what you need. Whereas in doc filmmaking, it's you're investing yourself into their story as much as they are investing their time into you. So um, there has to be give and take there um, in, in doc filmmaking is, how, is, is what I found the difference, if you may. And, um, and I'm still learning. Uh, but, but what I usually do is that I, am, I start by telling them about who I am. Um, which, which then gives them the allowance to open up um, and it takes time. It, it's a process. Some, some individuals open up really easily. Some take a longer time. Patience is, is the biggest. Uh, yes, he is right. Patience with your subjects is, is absolutely true because uh, <laughs> they can not, be frustrating, not, I'm sure. Not just, not just <laughs> them, but in general, because it's important um, that you are patient um, and, and earn their. Um, earn their blessings and trust is how I would put it. Um, that's very important for me. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I'm I always curious about like how, how, you know, when a documentary or you're watching a documentary, you wonder about how, how real it is. Like, uh, like where there ever like uh, being frustrated with your subjects, uh, the idea there, like w where you just wanted to tell them, just, just say this. <laughs> No, that didn't happen on this one. No, but I, I, you know, I'm sure that there are some documentaries where, uh, where yes. uh, filmmakers do that and and say like, if you sh please say this, and then they do. <laughs> but just because it works with the film, but uh, it's it seems like documentary is some kind of game where different people are different playing. They're playing different levels or something. You know, like. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, something we definitely didn't go like, say this for me now, but no. we definitely, if, you know, <laughs> I always do when I do that, but it feels a little wrong. Uh, right, yeah. Philosophical differences, I guess. But oh, yeah. uh, something that we did do is, you know, you asked, Prajala would ask a question, and maybe we didn't hear something that, you know, they didn't answer it the way they've answered it before. And we think that their answer in our pre interview meetings was a lot better. So mm -hmm. Pradella would maybe ask it again in a different way a little bit to see if you yeah. know, it's a better response. Uh, yeah, and that's how we went about it in this particular the, the other thing we did was, for instance, the first opening teaser that you see, um, all of them are saying five crazy things that blah, 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 you know, did. And that's how the movie opens. Um, that was a question, what are the five crazy things that Madhu Parab did in his life? And we asked them to start answering with the five crazy things that Madhu Parab did were, uh, so that in, ed in the edit, it becomes easier, right? To piece those okay, yeah. together. Hmm. Um, so the other thing that I found the difference in, in uh, verbose uh, storytelling versus visual is the fact that um, asking a lot of tell me questions. Uh, so very narrative, uh, at least for this one, this particular doc, um, where you, we wanted the four um, interviewees to paint us who Madhu was because Madhu wasn't present and we had to create his presence. Um, and that was only possible through those four voices. 
Um, and in order to do that, it was a lot of narrative questions. Tell me, tell me, tell me. Um, and they did. And then, you know, you when you are editing, um, and he can, Rodrigo can talk more about that because he's edited this movie too, um, is the fact that um, it sort of comes together um, in that in that place. Editing is something I'm excited about. It, it's where the story comes together, literally. You piece it, um, and it's it, it really excites me. Um, most people don't like it, I think. I don't know, but I love it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'd say I, I, I think it's as as a former editor of writer writing wise too. I, I feel like a that's that's where you you can really shape something into mm -hmm. into something uh, uh, exactly what you want. Um, so so we're at the last couple minutes of the oh the, the, the call. I know. Yeah. Well, thankfully we have <laughs> another one uh, coming up um, next week. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I just wanted to ask one last question. Um, so, so what, what about this project are you most proud of? You go first. Uh, <laughs> uh, what am I the most proud of? Uh, whew, I think just the ability to compress such a complicated storyline into 25 minutes. Uh, there's a lot of stories that we just couldn't include in the documentary. Uh, Madhu Parab would go up to the Confederation building to read uh, local politicians' fortune through uh, the uh, palm reading, which is very quirky, wow. very weird. Uh, we couldn't <laughs> include that and just so many others. So I think uh, I like the fact that we managed to compress it into 25 minutes. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I I'm just proud that I I got through it. To be honest, in itself, is, is <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> come on, I, I I have no background in filmmaking, and I um I was part of this, so that I'm definitely proud of. And I'm proud that I told the Newfoundland and Labrador story. So um. I'm proud of that. It is it is a Newfoundland and Labrador story, and uh, that's what I set out to do, um, and that's what I did. So, um, yeah. Excellent, uh, Prashwal. You have a show coming up that uh, people should know about, right? <laughs> what? Oh, 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 oh yes. Yeah. Wait, what? I do. I have no. Oh, idea yeah, you do. You really do. You're, 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 you have your hands in so many different projects. It's amazing. Can you tell? Uh, it's a, okay. Can you explain? It? Sorry, I didn't mean to surprise you. <laughs> no, I mean <laughs> such is the nature. Remember of that story. thing? Um, <laughs> yes, it's called the Tales of Dwipa. Um, mm -hmm. um, it was performed last year in public parks uh, for free. Um, it is being jointly presented this year by White Rooster Theater and uh, Resource Center RCAT. So sorry, I do not know the full form. I should look it up. I'm so sorry, Nicole. Um, and um, they have jointly come together to present the Tales of Dwipa. Uh, the Tales of Dwipa are a retelling of the Panchatantra, which are um, millennial old uh, Indian stories that I've taken and set in, into a Newfoundland and Labradorian context with today's themes uh, around, um, I mean, for instance, there's a friendship between an orca and a chipmunk. <laughs> sorry, orca and a chipmunk. Um, the orca happens to be vegetarian. Um, there's um, <laughs> the, the stories revolve around uh, losing uh, one's home and finding a new home, um, about uh, misogyny, about racism, but told to kids in a very relatable fashion. Um, the difference is that uh, this time, because of the pandemic, we aren't performing in parks. Uh, we have translated those into a puppet show which is bringing theater and film together, um, which is a very interesting concept uh, in, in today's time, actually. So it's, it's uh, being directed by Santiago Guzman. It stars Robin Vivian Santi and uh, Ananya. Brian Kenny is doing the tech. Um, Jamie Skidmore designed the puppet set. Sarah Tilly did the puppets. Um, Melanie Ozan, Yoon Jung Cho, um, and uh, Ruth Lawrence, of course, uh, the powerhouse behind this. Um, yeah, 
I'll stop rambling. The Tales of Reaper, July 11th, uh, coming soon. To July 10th online? July so, 11th, uh, to, uh, yes, coming soon to a digital screen near you. To, to all, this, all of the screens, all of the screens. Yes. I, I, I'm very excited about it. I, I think uh, puppet, puppetry is, is just... Uh, just an avenue that is not explored fully. Uh, uh, no, and we were doing some research and this could be the first brown, um, brown South Asian female puppet in Canada, like in can possibly in Canadian history. <laughs> um, wow. So yeah, that could, as far that's as quite a, that's our quite a claim. research goes, but then if you find someone <laughs> else, please let us know. <laughs> <laughs> you should write it in Wikipedia, just so, just so yes, it's real. it should have you know? its own Wikipedia. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a big push to, to do uh, do more uh, local writing of it for the Wikipedia <sighs> pages. So, so that could be one of the things. No, <laughs> please sure. don't put this on Wikipedia. <laughs> I beg you. <laughs> well, uh, thank you both uh, for joining us this week. We'll uh, uh, And uh, we'll see you again next week. Uh, and uh, to all of the uh, film, people who joined us online, thank you to, for joining. And um, uh, we'll, we'll meet again. And if you have any questions, uh, especially to the doc challengers, uh, the five minute doc challenge is happening now. Um, and uh, people are making documentary films uh, right now and probably have lots of questions. So the, the, this is an opportunity for them to uh, to ask uh, some established local filmmakers. Uh, so thank you. Uh, thanks again. And uh, uh, Sandy, you have anything else you want to say? Uh, no, just thank you oh, for right. joining us. And yeah. <laughs> no, thank you so much. It for was wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much for this opportunity and for giving Condom, the Condom King of Newfoundland uh, another breathing space. Thank you. Condom King of Newfoundland. Uh, wouldn't you like to be King of the Night? <laughs> <laughs> On that note. Uh, see you next time. <laughs>